Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the end of our series, uh, an appendix lecture uh, that we're going to title Interesting Odds and Ends. And, you know, when you're reading like a, a popular physics book, for example, um, and they relegate some of the more mathematical topics to an appendix for those particularly interested in, in the deeper dive and the harder topics. That's what this is, a little bit of a deeper dive into a few aspects of the chemistry of DNA that I uh, didn't want to leave unmentioned, but I realize that they're definitely not for everyone. But I think that they really do point to the notion that DNA, um, especially given that it has been present since the beginning of earliest life, very close to the age of planet Earth, uh, therefore not having had a chance to evolve, must have been very specifically designed. And so I would like to remind us of the chemical structure of DNA. It is a double helix with a three main chemical components. One is a phosphate molecule that is basically a phosphate anion that is originally hooked to four oxygens and therefore having three negative charges. And this phosphate anion is really then a phosphodiester because what it does is it will link to two five-membered sugars, the ribose sugars, and phosphate forms the backbone of the DNA double helix. And each phosphate links to the five-membered carbon sugar, ribose, one side linking to the th number three carbon, the other side linking to the number five carbon. And once again, this is for those who have some familiarity with chemistry, so you know that in a cyclic sugar, for example, the carbons are numbered. So we have um, the five prime, three prime, or three prime, five prime linkages of the phosphate anion to a five-membered sugar ribose. And then those riboses are in turn linked to heterocyclic bases, the purines and the pyrimidines. And we know already that there are four bases and that guanine, which links to cytosine, guanine has two rings, cytosine has one, and adenine, which links to thymine, adenine has two rings and thymine has one. So guanine has two rings, cytosine has one ring, and they link together with three hydrogen bonds. And Adenine has two rings and thymine has one ring and they link together with two hydrogen bonds. And you can see all of that on this diagram. So the questions that we will be asking is number one, why the phosphate anion? Why did nature choose phosphate? Phosphate is very, very common in biology, in nature, but when you look at the work of synthetic organic chemists, they rarely use phosphates in their work. Secondly, why ribose? Uh, that is an interesting question. There are multiple sugars. You're probably familiar with glucose, and that is a six-membered sugar, not a five-membered sugar. And there are also other five-membered sugars. So why does nature choose ribose rather than one of the other five-membered sugars? And why ribose instead of, for example, a six-membered sugar like glucose? Uh, so you'll be tackling those questions and others in this appendix lecture, inshallah. So let us start off with the issue of why phosphates. And our concern is why phosphate in the DNA backbone but let me point us to an article by Professor Frank Westheimer. He was um, professor of chemistry at Harvard uh, 
and he wrote an article in the journal Science, which we have mentioned before is one of the two leading scientific journals in the world, Journal Science and the journal Nature. And he wrote an article called Why Nature Chose Phosphates. He was talking about all of organic chemistry, including, of course, ATP, the main energy molecule, but he devoted a section in this paper to phosphate in the DNA backbone. And you have here the abstract of the paper. And basically, what he says in this paper is that while organic chemists rarely use phosphates, it is ubiquitous in nature. And we will see soon why it was chosen for the DNA backbone. But I just wanted to let you know that this is a topic of significant interest because nature chose a molecule that organic chemists find very difficult uh, to work with, to be able to involve in catalytic reactions, and yet it was nature's chosen molecule. Now, the same idea, sort of taking off on Professor Westheimer's paper, is a later paper in 2013 uh, in uh, the Quarterly Reviews of Biophysics. And this paper is titled, Why Nature Really Chose Phosphate. And this paper is, if you love chemistry, you should read this paper. It is a very, very deep dive into the chemistry of phosphates. But let us begin by saying that if you want to make DNA to store the key genetic information of life, you want DNA to be stable. That's number one. And stable molecules that don't cross react are somewhat hard to come by. And so you see a quote from this paper that phosphodiester linkages in contrast, in contrast to other sorts of molecules, are among the most stable bonds known to man, with the half-life for the hydrolysis of the phosphate oxygen bonds holding together DNA expected to be on the scale of 30 million years. So that is how stable this molecule is. So object number one is that it's a stable molecule and particularly stable in water. You don't want to put DNA in water and have it dissolve by being hydrolyzed, by reacting with the water molecules. And you know, if you've ever stirred salt into a cup of water, how easy it is for things to dissolve in water. So phosphates, because they have three negative charges, it is phosphate linked to um, four oxygens and having three negative charges can afford to link to two other molecules and then distribute one of those negative charges uh, throughout the backbone to sort of repel water molecules. So you can think of the negative charges on the phosphate anion as forming an electric shield around the DNA to protect it from water molecules coming in and breaking the bonds. And you see how incredibly stable the phosphodiester linkages are. Okay, and here's um, a blurb from the paper that we were just looking at, and it goes into more detail. So we've said that the phosphate uh, linkages, the phosphodiester structure, keeps the molecule extremely stable. That's number one. Number two, it prevents unintended hydrolysis of DNA because the negative charges distribute across the phosphate backbone to form an electrical shield that repels water. Number three, the same negative charge keeps DNA inside the cell membrane. Uh, it being a charged molecule, a polar molecule, has difficulty penetrating the cell membrane. And so we, of course, don't want DNA to leak outside nuclear membranes or cell membranes. And it turns out 
that the phosphate anion with its negative charge helps keep DNA inside the cell membrane. But probably the two most important aspects are what is being said, or one of them is being said in this blurb, and that is, well, of course, we want the phosphodiester linkages to be very stable, but we also want to be able to break them apart when needed because we synthesize new DNA molecules. So we have to be able to break apart old DNA molecules. We have to be able to bring in new bases to link to the new backbone. Uh, we have to be able to unravel the DNA and use one strand to replicate the other. And so the fact that these bonds are very stable, as this paper says, that it's this same charge to charge repulsion that makes phosphate ester hydrolysis so unfavorable also makes it possible to regulate by exploiting the electrostatics. And what that means is that it is possible for enzymes to selectively come in and take this extremely stable bond and break it apart when needed in a very rate controlled process. And this rate control is governed by very subtle interplay of charges. And it is the same very subtle interplay of charges that helps DNA have its amazing fidelity of replication. When we unravel one DNA strand and we want to connect the proper complementary bases, it turns out that if we bring in a wrong base, like let's say I have adenine and I know I will need to bring in thymine on the complementary strand that I am replicating to copy DNA, because remember adenine only hooks to thymine. So what if I try to bring in a wrong base? What if I try to bring in a cytosine or a guanine? Well, it turns out that the charges on those molecules, the sort of electrostatic field of those molecules, interplaying with the electrostatic field of the phosphate molecule prevents DNA polymerase from hooking up the wrong base. And apparently phosphate is the only molecule that can do this, that the subtleties of the electrostatics are such that it is able to make a very stable molecule, but allow hydrolysis when we need it, and allow hydrolysis only if the proper complementary bases are brought in. And this field, if you read the 2013 paper um, that, that I showed you, is still in its infancy, still not well understood, but seemingly there are very, very compelling physical chemistry reasons why nature chose a phosphate backbone. Now, one last point to make here, and that is we talked about how when making DNA, when replicating DNA, how do we hook the phosphate to the ribose and uh, hook that to the heterocyclic bases? Well, we need enzymes. And one of these enzymes, for example, is DNA polymerase. And it turns out that trying to hook phosphate to ribose without enzymes is nearly impossible. The reaction rate would proceed exceedingly slowly. So enzymes are required to replicate and synthesize DNA. However, where do we get the enzymes? How does the body know how to make enzymes? Well, from DNA. So you need the enzymes to make the DNA, but you need the DNA to make the enzymes. I hope this sounds familiar. This is another classic example of the chicken and egg problem, and the only solution would have been to develop DNA and the matching enzymes together in a planned way.